Let's give God praise for our visitors from around the world, our internet audience, Web TV, PTMB, CNET, YouTube. We're out there on social media. Some of you are blasting us on Periscope and your Facebook pages. Come on, give God praise for our audience that watches us every week, checking us out. We honor God for you. We want to encourage you. Come and worship with us. What you see on TV, on the internet is great, but what you see here and experience live and in living color is so much better. We want to encourage you every Sunday, 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock, our Sunday school, 10 o'clock a.m., our morning worship. If this sermon is a blessing to you, we encourage you to uh, click on our e-giving page and donate uh, to our ministry. Any any amount will be, we'll be grateful for. Or you can click on our contact page and just send us a, an email or a little note to let us know that you've been blessed by this word. One more time, Prayer Temple, give our visitors from around the world a hand clap of praise. Thank you so much for tuning in. Amen. All right, let me, let me get out the way because I think the, the, the breaker has been set. God is already glorified. Amen. I'm glad at our church, we don't, we don't wait on this moment to get what we need from God. Amen. We get what we need the minute we walk in. <laughs> is that right? Amen. So we thank God. Let's, can we talk about Jesus again? Yeah. Who tired of talking about Jesus? Yeah. Better not raise your hand. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about Jesus again. I want you to go to Matthew chapter 19 and, uh, and verse 26. And uh, just, just lay there a sec. And uh, I'll, I'll get you in, in just, just about 60 seconds or so. Thank you, worshipers. Thank you. Thank you, worshipers. Those of you who missed Sunday school, you, um, you, you missed uh, a, a powerful lesson through Deacon Smith. As I always say, all of our teachers are different, and Deacon, Deacon Smith just has his, his own style. He's going to be slow school and old school on purpose. And he, he, just, he just takes his time, never gets lost, doesn't get tripped up, just, just talks like he's talking to you. If you want to hear the word in just a nice dialogue, easy to understand, practical way, come to Sunday school and hear all of our teachers. Deacon Smith did a fantastic job this morning teaching our, our, Sunday, school, our Sunday school class. <clears throat> As we've talked about Jesus, right now you, you should have it all in your spirit. We've been really uh, lifting up various truths about Jesus. And one in particular we talked about is who is Jesus? And, and when you hear that now, you know, according to Matthew 16 and 18, that he is the Christ. What? The son of the living God. He ain't no ordinary. All right. I'll take that. All right. So, so that's what we talked about as relates to his, his identity. Because you really can't worship a God that you do not know who he is. Is that right? All right. To worship God is to worship him for who he is. And there are times in our lives where we ought to be able to worship God just based on the fact that he is God. Does that make sense? All right. Second thing that we establish over these weeks <coughs> We've established his mission. Well, what is, what is God's mission? Well, according to Matthew 1 and 21, he came to save us from our sins. Is that all right? Uh, the word sin in church, can't say it a lot now, people walk out, but invariably that's why he came, to make a difference in our life so that you and I would not be the same person we were last week, last month, last year, or even yesterday. Amen. Anybody see themselves changing in God? You see yourself growing stronger and wiser and better. The stuff that used to mess with you, you're finding it doesn't mess with you quite the same. Is, is that all right? Well, that's, that's all Jesus. And I don't want you to, when we leave this series, I don't want you to quench that or stop that or even feel uncomfortable. If you go hang around Jesus, he will change you. 
And don't be afraid of that. Don't apologize for that. Let him, let him do what he do. <laughs> let him change you. Let him, let, him, let him change the way you talk. You'll find yourself talking differently. You find yourself responding differently. You find yourself not having a desire to go to the places you used to go. Am I making sense in here? Now that ain't gonna be true for everybody, but for those who can say I used where I used to go, I don't go no more, you can say amen to that point because it was God who did it. It was God who took that taste out of your mouth. It was God who who put something inside of you that's making you different today than you were on yesterday. And I want to encourage you, particularly my young people, just, and parents, let your children hang around God. Just let them hang. I don't, I don't, I don't know what they be talking about at church. I don't, I don't really get what's going on in the church. I come to tell you, if you just hang around them, <laughs> sooner or later, it'll get all up on you. Amen. Amen. So then those were our previous uh, discussions. What I, what I want to look at today in particular uh, this month is I want to look at a side of Jesus or a side of God that so far, 13 weeks in, we haven't, we haven't really looked at, but we can't deny it either. And I want to look at the powerful side of Jesus Christ. I want to look at the part of Jesus that defies odds. I want to look at Jesus from the perspective of knowing there's somebody in our lives who can do stuff for us that we cannot do for ourselves. Anybody interested in that? facet of Jesus. Jesus describes himself as this. Matthew 28, 18, he says, I have all power in my hand. Somebody say all power. All power. Now, be because he has all power, that means there's an element to him that knows how to work miracles or more importantly, knows how to defy odds. He knows how to do stuff. When, our, when we run out of resources, he knows how to give us something that we didn't know we had. There are times in your life when your life is absolutely haywire, and yet you're holding it together. Am I talking to at least 15 people in here? But th things are going crazy, and yet you're smiling, you, you, you're doing your thing, and every now and then somebody asks, how are you doing that? How you pulling that off? You, you, your mother just died. How you, how you doing that? You ain't going to break down and you can look him in the face and say it was nobody <laughs> but Jesus that pulled me through that thing. Is that right? Anybody in here ever tried Jesus? Won't he make a way somehow? I look to the hills from which cometh my help. I came to this conclusion, all my help comes from, touch your neighbor and say, it's nobody but Jesus, nobody but Jesus. He's powerful. He's an awesome God. And what, what makes him awesome is his ability to do anything. Moses, Moses, way back in the Old Testament, Genesis 18, 14, he asked God a question. He said, God, I hear what you're saying, but I, I just want to know, is anything too hard for the Lord? Moses asked that because at that time, we had only known God through creation. We didn't know God yet through chaos. And nothing, I mean, the flood, but Moses wasn't around when God brought him through the flood. And so Moses asked this question, this inquisition, from really a narrative of not really knowing the other side of God. And so he asked God, I want to know, you want me to go out and you want me to do this and do that? I, I just need to know, is there anything that you can't do? 
And, and, we, and we go through the Old Testament. We go through time. And Jesus in Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, says, Moses, I want to attempt to answer your question. And in verse 26, Jesus says, with men, preach Reverend Johnson, this is impossible. But what? What? I wish y'all would shout just on what you just read there. So, so Moses, there's nothing too hard for God. <laughs> that should make at least 48 of y'all shout real quick right there, right there. God can handle whatever it is we're going through. There's nothing too hard for God. With men, maybe, it's impossible. But with God, what? All things. All right. now, now, Minister John, in order for us then to accept that, means we have to buy into the idea then that with God, anything is possible. I just want you to think that through a second. Whatever it is you're going through this morning, I want you to leave out of here knowing anything. With God, anything is possible. If that... If, 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 if my thesis is correct, then it means there's never a moment a believer panics. Because, you know, on your worst day, God can turn that thing around. Hi, Rev. Because what? Anything <laughs> is possible. I don't know if God could be God if he couldn't do anything. I'm not sure we would worship him the same if he could. What if when you, you prayed to God, he says, ah, I really got the power to handle that. Ah, that's, that's a little bit beyond my comprehension. That's a little bit beyond me. No. no, the beauty of asking God to do something in your life is knowing that whatever it is, Whatever it is. <laughs> he 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 could handle it. I, I see look me in the face. You you want to ride with me, but you still not sure. You you trapped right in that idea of I hear you, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I was I was at a I was a, at a minister's meeting on on Monday. Uh ten pastors sit around uh, sit around a table. It's 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 really what I call my my pastoral counseling session. I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have ten pastors. I could bounce frustrations and heartaches and concerns and all that kind of stuff off. And and so we're sitting at a table. King Malian's meeting Bishop Van, and uh, we just we go around the table and we just what what's going on? How things are going? Kind of deal. And uh, I'm sharing my little stuff, and uh, I'm hearing them share their stuff, and I realized. How blessed I am. Touch your name and say, you bless. You, you bless because somebody else is going through something worse. You, you ready to cry over your little stuff and you find out, oh my God, I didn't, wow. You thinking about quitting, Doc? Touch your name and say, it's perspective. It's perspective, man. Next time you cry about what you ain't got, and I ain't got this, and I ain't got that, and I wish I had this, and I wish I had that, then take a moment and consider somebody who don't have what you have. Somebody will shout over that hoopty you drive in. Next time you drive in your hoopty, just ride by a bus stop. And before you complain about what it don't do, thank God I am at least riding. Those of you at the bus stop, before you complain, you on the bus, just take a moment and think about somebody who don't have legs to walk. Come on, touch your neighbor and say, it could be worse. It could be worse. I ain't going to complain about my little circumstance. It could be worse. But I didn't come to preach that. I didn't come to preach that. We can shout there. I didn't come to preach that. We went around the table, and all the pastors lamented their concerns, and there was this 
one pastor there from Flint, Bishop Van asked him, he said, how's it, how's it going in Flint? And uh, it was a loaded question. I don't, I don't think we were quite prepared and ready for what he, what he was going to say. He says the water has reached an epidemic. Is that a crisis? He says, but you know that. He says, let me share with you some things that the media don't talk about. And I'm telling you, as he says this, he's, he's welling up with tears. And of course, we can't help but to get emotional as well. Because he says in his church, he has seniors who cannot open the water bottle, pour it in the pot for the water to boil, carry the pot upstairs to a bathroom, to the tub, so they could take a bath. So what they do, he says, they take baths in the contaminated water and pray that everything's going to be all right. He shared with us there were children in his church who last year were on honor roll. And this year, they're getting kicked out of school for behavioral problems. He shared with us people who were in the local jail in Flint, and because they're prisoners, they are forced to drink. Because they're prisoners, nobody, nobody cares. He told us about members who have rashes and legions on their skin. And they've literally said to him, Pastor, if I die, keep fighting so they can fix it. Many of the stores have closed in Flint. Many of the restaurants have closed. Flint, Kroger's left. Myers left. Pastor can't even baptize members. If a member join, he can't baptize them because he cannot put them in the water. Churches are closing, and he's, he's thoroughly convinced if he stays in 10 years, he believes he's going to do more funerals than have members. And he said that. We heard him. We're around the room. He's, he's got tears in his eyes. We're, we're welling up. And Bishop Van says to me, says, Johnson, close us out in prayer. And I pray, and the only thing I could come up with to get me through the prayer was with God. Yeah. All things yeah. are possible. I said, God, as a consequence of that, we believe that you can do anything. And I said, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. We, we, we rose up from the table. We hugged. And I got in my car and I drove from Second Ave home. And I had to reconcile within myself. A God who can do anything and yet it seems like everything is happening in Flint. I can't, 
I couldn't reconcile within myself how a God who's all good and yet we could have all bad and flip. And, and I wish I could tell y'all when I got home in the car, I got it. I wish I could tell you when, when I went to bed that night, I got it. I wish I could tell you he woke me up early in the morning and I got it. I didn't get it. I didn't get it, and, and about Wednesday was approaching, and by that time, normally I have my outline, and I said, God, you, you can't want me to preach this if I don't understand it myself. This, this can't be the word you have for me. And, and, and God, as, as if I'm talking to you, he just said, look at the scripture and read it again. When I read it again, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things. Oh, glory. I'm done. Are possible. That's when God gave me the revelation. Here's what God said to me, and I'm going to say it to you. And you process it in your spirit how you need to. Here's what God said. God says, I have the ability to do anything, but I do not have the authority to do everything. I said, God, oh my God, that's it. That's, that's it. That's how I'm going to settle my spirit. You have the ability to do everything. Anything, but you do not have the authority to do everything. And I know you just, God, authority, what? Yeah. One day I'm going to preach a series of sermon on the stuff God can't do. There are four things God can't do. For the context of our discussion, I'll give you one. There's one thing God can't do. He cannot go against a person's will. He's God. He's sovereign. He's supreme. He's powerful. He's all-knowing. But one thing he will not do is force himself on nobody. God is so bad. Here's what he says in his word. When it comes to blessing, he says, even though I know you need some stuff, he says, I can't make a move until you ask. He says in his word, you have not. Because you ask not. Four things he can't do. I'm only talking about one today for the context of our time, and I'm only going to say it and then I'm going to move on. He cannot go against a person's will. There are saved knuckleheads out there, and the best God does is behold, I stand at the door. All I can do is not. Why Rev? Why Rev? Why, why can't he force himself in? Why Rev? Why can't he put himself over man's choice? Because a God has to be chosen. A true God can't choose for you. A true God has to be chosen. When God said that, I said, I got it. You have the authority, the ability to do, it, to do anything, but not the authority to do everything because there's some stuff we as men and women cause, bring on ourselves. Which takes me here. Two points. I'm, I'll, I'll be done with this. First thing. We know God is not 
omnicausal. Omnicausal. Say omnicausal. Which means this. God does not cause everything. God does not cause everything. Now, we cannot blame God for all things bad. Preach, Reverend Jones. God did not cause the frustration in Flint. He did not anoint politicians to unhook the water supply from filtered water of Detroit and tell them to connect it to the poison river water in Flint. God did not tell some knuckleheads to go and shoot a six-month-old baby, a two-year-old baby, a four-year-old kid. God does not authorize carjackings and rapes and murders and robbery. God is not omnicausal. Touch your name and say, you can't blame God for everything. Tragedy makes us assign blame. We gotta, we, when something happens, we, the only way we can process it, we gotta blame it on somebody or something. It, it can't just be, it, it's, it's, it's gotta be something. When, when an airplane goes down, we, somebody didn't check the engine. Something, it can't just be the airplane went down. When somebody dies, it, it had to be, did they have a heart attack? Did, did they trip and fall? Did they did this and that? It can't just be they died because tragedy demands we come up with some kind of blame. And oftentimes when it is beyond our comprehension, the person we blame is God. It's God. God, if, if he would only, just like Martha, if, if you had been here, yes. preach Reverend Johnson, my, my, my brother would, would not have died, but, but you have to understand that God does not interfere with man's choice. From Genesis, Revelation, he has never, not one time, forced himself on anybody. And so when things happen, sometimes we have, to, we have to look within. We have to do introspection, see if it's something we cause that brought the dilemma. Now, as relates to Flint, I hear you. Same question I had for God. Well, God, what did they do to cause it? It's, it is not that the victims did anything to cause it, but the silly politicians who tried to save a little money Put money over people. You know what is interesting is when they made the switch, they did not, GM complained about it, and then the GM plant this in Flint, you know they immediately got filters for the GM plant. The, the, the state house, they, they knew something was wrong because they demanded at least to get filters. Can you imagine people complaining? about water and they're being ignored? Now, what did they do to cause it? Now, this, this is the second piece of, of what God said. God says, I am not only omnicausal, but we know God is omnipotent. Somebody say omnipotent. Which means he has all power. Which means he can do what? Anything. Now, here, here's where I got excited because what God says to me is, even though I did not break it, I've got the power to fix it. You ought to be excited about a God who can fix stuff that he didn't break. I should have at least 45 of y'all over here doing, come on. There's some stuff in your, in your life and my life, watch this, that I broke. 
Anybody here got some stuff in your life that you broke? God said, I don't care how you broke it. I have enough power. To fix it, to fix it, to fix it. As, as bad as things are in the world, God is still good. God is good on a bad day. God is good on a rainy day. God is good when I got money. God is good when I don't have money. God is good when I'm driving. God is good when I'm walking. Would you just touch two people and say, God is still good, still good, still good. Oh, taste and see. <laughs> that the Lord is good. So when God said it to me like that, I said, God, I can process what you're saying. Because you do have power to do anything, but you bump up against the authority of being able to do everything. There's some things God, God just ain't going to do. As relates to Flint, our victims, our job is to keep praying so that God can, because if anything is possible, our job is to keep praying that God will sooner or later show up and show out and work that thing out. I have any witnesses in here who know God, God will do that. Now, God says, because of that, there are at least two things he gives us with this. With God, all things are possible, and I'm done. The first thing he does when God is in control, he gives us what? Promise. Say it loud. Promise. Say it loud. Promise. Which means that as I'm going through life and something happens, I ought to have the confidence to know that if I just ask God, to work it out. God, what? Will work it out. Do I have any witnesses who can testify? Don't lie. Don't, don't you say it. Who can say God has worked some things out in my life based on what I asked him. May not come when you want them. Who glory. God, God gives us a quiet confidence to know that he got this thing under control and that confidence is where we get our peace from. The Bible talks about peace that surpasses, come on, talk to me in here. All, so, so, so the reason you haven't broke down, the reason you don't look like what you're going through is because housed within you is a resilient confidence to know that God's can do anything, and God is going to work this thing out on my behalf. Watch this. I don't know how. I don't know when. I don't even know where. But I do know. I hear you, Sister J. Come on, touch your neighbor and say, he will. Some, some of us in here, some of us in here, uh, we, uh, we have at least two or more credit cards. Some of us, some of us in here, some of you yeah. only have one credit card. And bless God for you. you do that. Don't, don't try to get no 10 of them, you know, whatever. But anyway, some of, us, some of us start off with one, one credit card. And then we said, hey, well, I, I'll get another. I, I'll get another credit card. Now, when you say it, I'm going to get the second credit card. Here's what you said. You said this. You tell me you didn't say this. I'm going to get this one. But I ain't going to use it. I'm, I'm going to put this up. What? <laughs> Did I preach this already? This, this, this going to be for... Emergencies only. As a matter of fact, I ain't, ain't going to even put it in my wallet. I ain't, it's going to sit in a drawer. It's, it's going to be in a drawer. And, uh, and if something happened, my, my car break down, I need some tires, bam, I got, I got a car. And, and, 
and it was a great plan. Until no sales showed up. Am I, am I talking to anybody here? You know? If you only got one credit card, just hang tight. We'll get you on the next point. Just hang tight. So some of us went and got a third one, fourth one, fifth, and some of you got ten still trying to do, but anyway, let's move on. So <laughs> remember, listen, how you felt when you knew you had that emergency credit card. Just, 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 I want you to think about it. I know it's been years ago. Just think about when you had a card that had a zero balance. Ooh. Ooh. It, it's not like you were saying, bring it on, flat tires, but you just, you had a different confidence about yourself. You talk to your car a little bit harder and I ain't going to have no problems with you today. But if I do, <laughs> am I talking to anybody in here? R remember how you felt? You felt to some degree like you were invincible because if something happened, you had this surge of cash or credit you could use just in case you needed it. Jesus says you should have the same confidence with me because I can do anything. You should leave the house with the same confidence of knowing whatever comes my way. I got a God who knows how to do the impossible. Come on, high five your neighbor and say, you ought to feel better. You ought to feel better because when God gets through with that thing, you coming out of that thing with your hands up? Just trust God. And he'll make everything. All right, can I get a witness in here? I'm done, V. I see the look on your face. The second thing, I'm done. He gives us. It's calm. It's such a neighbor say, calm down. This is what, this what God had to say to me. This week, I'm all excited and all, all energetic over this text and Flint. And God had to say to me, Johnson, calm down. Chill out. I got this. I said, God, how, 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 you want me, how you want me to explain that? God said, turn to Mark. I'm done. <laughs> turn everybody to Mark. I'm done. Let's get out of here. Mark chapter 4. Verse 35. You already there, V. Mark chapter 4. Verse, verse 35. It says, in the same day when the evening was come, he said unto them what? Who said that? What does he say? If Jesus says, let us pass over to the other side, then it means no matter what comes in between this side and that side, Jesus said, I got that thing. I wouldn't ask you to pass over to the other side if I didn't have the power to get you. Preach, Reverend Johnson. Watch this. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him us, I mean, other little ships. Verse 34, this is why you need God. Verse 34 says what? Stop. There rose what? What kind of storm? A regular storm. An average storm. A what? This is why you need God, because there's going to come a storm in your life that you and I are not designed to handle by ourselves. A great storm, and what? The waves did what? Uh-huh. So according to verse 37, what's going on? Chaos. Isn't that right? Things are going crazy. 
Things are going haywire. And I hear God saying, chill. Calm down. Hold on, God. You, a, a great storm. And a ship. Now watch this. Here's how we know. Verse 38 says, and what? Don't read it fast. What? Asleep. Stop. Who was asleep? Peter? James? Who? What happened in verse 37? What is Jesus doing in 38? Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold, hold on. What's going on in 37? What is he doing in 38? Mm. And he ain't just sleep. Bible says on a pillow. Now, now you know it's, it's a difference in a nap and good sleep. Do I have any witnesses in here? When you, when you sit down on the chair and your head nod on the chair, that's, that's one level of sleep. But if you told your kid, hey, go get my pillow. You intend what? Sleep, sleep. Jesus didn't take a nap. He went to sleep, sleep. <laughs> What's going on in 37? What's going on? What is Jesus doing in 38? On a pillow. I came to tell 48 of y'all in here who are in verse 37. Calm down. God's going to give us the ability to go to sleep while chaos is going on. <laughs> Touch your neighbor and say, calm down. calm down. Who in the world could go to sleep while a storm, not, no, 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 Why a great storm is going on? Filling up the ship. And we know we know it was quite a storm because the disciples went to him and said, Hey, Jesus, do you care? The only person who could go to sleep during a great storm is somebody who knows they can do, back to my main point, anything. I came to tell you, you cannot drown if Jesus is on your boat. So instead of asking how can Jesus go to sleep during a storm, I came to ask you, why don't you get some sleep? During the storm. I, I'm, I'm done. Some stuff God's got to handle. By himself. So when God told me. Calm down. I heard God say to me. I got this. I heard him say. Johnson there are. Some storms that you can't handle. I heard God say there are some storms that you ain't skilled for. But I heard God say that when the storms of life are raging, learn how to turn it over to me and I will, 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 will make everything all right. Would you high five your neighbor and say, neighbor, calm down. 
Is there anybody in here who need to learn how to just calm down? I know you're going through, but the Lord told me to tell you, calm down. I said, calm down, because I know how to make everything go right why we're trying to figure it out the Lord has already worked it out is there anybody in him that's ever been in the storm and the Lord kept you covered while the rain was coming down the Lord kept you covered while things were going haywire. The only way you made it is because God did something that money came by. God did something that an extra credit card couldn't do. But he came through and stood on our boat and said, peace. Be still. I came to tell somebody, calm down, because God said, peace. Be still. Won't he make a way? Somehow, just have to have your neighbor and say, neighbor, he will make a way. Somehow, won't he do it? This problem that I had, I just couldn't seem to solve. I prayed and I prayed, but I kept getting deeper in wrong. Help me preach in him. But I turned it over to Jesus. Just do me a turnaround and say, I turned it over to Jesus. And I stopped worrying about it. Won't it make a way? I said, won't it make a way? Yeah, won't it make a way? Somehow, 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 I don't know when, and I don't know where, but I do know somehow, some way, somewhere, when this life is over, God's going to work that thing out. And he's going to make everything. All right, come on, touch your neighbor and say, calm down. Stand to your feet. Come on, touch the neighbor on the other side and say, calm down. Let God handle the stuff he can handle. It don't make no sense. We didn't cause Flint. They didn't cause it. But it's got to be in God's hands now. And we don't need to lose faith in God while he calms down that situation. God's going to do what he said he's going to do. Because he said he's going to do. Second thing God can't do. I ain't here to preach. The second thing God cannot do. He cannot lie. If God said he's going to fix it. He's going to fix it. No matter what we read. Let God. Flint could be a moment for God to work a whole new set of miracles. Is that all right? Let God do what he does. And God will bless us as we go through it. Now, I don't want you to look at Flint as much as I want you to look at your life. There's some stuff in your life that's been crazy, been haywire. Watch this. Stuff that even you and I broke our sails. But God doesn't care who broke it. God says, I can fix it. 
High five two people and say, God can fix it. God can fix it. It won't always be like this. The God Lord will perfect that concerning me sooner. Sooner 